old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. As Will Allen Dromgoole's early 20th century poem, The Bridge Builder, suggests, there's just something about a bridge. Unlike other forms of civil infrastructure, which tend either to fade into the background or to draw our ire for despoiling the landscape, bridges often inspire respect, sometimes even reverence, and occasionally, poetry. And justly so. Who can look upon the Golden Gate Bridge and not be inspired? Who wouldn't feel a sense of awe crossing the Tampa Bay on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge at sunrise? Who could gaze upward at West Virginia's New River Gorge Bridge and not feel her pulse quicken just a bit? Monumental structures like these represent extraordinary triumphs of human industry, ingenuity, and creativity. And yet, iconic as they are, these great spans are entirely unrepresentative of the bridges that have the greatest influence on our everyday lives. According to the Federal Highway Administration, there are over 500,000 bridges in the U.S. The vast majority of these are not graceful suspension bridges or towering arches, but rather simple highway overpasses and modest spans across small streams. And so, in the spirit of everyday engineering, I'd like to focus today's lecture on these seemingly mundane structures, bridges that, I suggest, can still inspire us, though perhaps in more subtle ways. I won't be discussing the more ambitious structural forms like suspension and cable stay bridges in this course, but if you're interested in learning more about them, I hope you'll check out my Great Courses lecture series, Understanding the World's Greatest Structures. Now, most of the bridges we encounter in our daily lives are simple multi-girder spans like this one. Let's use a computer model to deconstruct this structure and see how it works. The main structural elements in a multi-girder bridge are, of course, the girders. We've already encountered girders in our lectures on residential building construction, and the meaning of the term is exactly the same here. A girder is a main beam that supports other elements of the structural system. In your home, these other elements are the floor joists and subfloor. In a multi-girder bridge, they're the components of this reinforced concrete deck, which we'll examine shortly. Now, as you'll recall, a beam is a structural element that carries load in flexure or bending, like this. In this normal mode of bending, which I'll refer to as concave upward, because the concave side of the bent beam is facing upward, in this normal mode of bending, the beam develops compression on top and tension on the bottom. And you can see this quite clearly because these vertical lines on my model, the black ones, get closer together at the top, that's compression, and farther apart at the bottom, and that's tension. Furthermore, because the vertical lines remain straight as the beam bends, we can see that the compression and tension vary linearly from top to bottom. Therefore, there must be a horizontal plane running through the middle of the beam along which there is neither tension nor compression. This plane, which is annotated with a red line on my model, is called the neutral axis. Now, the bridge girders represented in my computer model are made of steel. Concrete girders are also quite common, and we'll examine these in a few minutes. Steel is an ideal material for bridge girders First, because it has equal strength in both tension and compression, and second, because it can be formed into these highly efficient I-shaped cross-sections. So why are steel girders usually I-shaped? The answer is that the I is an inherently efficient shape for carrying loads in flexure. Let's do an experiment. These two beams, one with a square cross-section, and one with an I-shaped cross-section, are made with exactly the same amount of material. Now, we can verify this by simply weighing both of them on this very simple balance scale. 
And because they balance, they weigh the same and therefore are made of the same amount of material. Now let's start with the square cross section. I'm gonna place it on a pair of supports and when I hang this weight from the center of it, you'll see that it deflects quite noticeably, it bends quite noticeably. In order to gauge how much it bends, I'm gonna take this straight edge and place it on the two supports. And looking at the gap between the straight edge and the beam in the center, I think you can see that the amount of deflection is on the order of one inch. But when I apply the same weight to our I-shaped cross section, and once again, hold my straight edge in place, you can see that the amount of deflection in this case with the I-shaped girder is less than one eighth of an inch. And indeed, if we loaded both of these beams to failure, we'd see a similar disparity in their flexural strengths. Now, why is this? Well, if we visualize the basic phenomenon of flexure, we can see the answer. Maximum compression occurs at the very top of the beam and then it decreases linearly to zero at the neutral axis. Maximum tension occurs at the bottom and also decreases linearly to zero at the neutral axis. Clearly, the material closest to the top and bottom of the beam are doing most of the heavy lifting and flexure. Thus, if we concentrate most of the beam's material out here, away from the neutral axis, we can greatly enhance the beam's load carrying capacity and that is why I-shaped beams are I-shaped. The three components of an I-shaped beam cross-section are its two horizontal elements, called flanges, and the vertical element, called the web. When this beam bends, the flanges provide almost all of its flexural strength. The web is really just there to hold the flanges in place and to resist several other types of loading that we'll discuss shortly. Now, theoretically, the farther the flanges are from the neutral axis, the stronger the beam will be. The steel girder that's commonly used in residential construction is called a hot rolled section. It's manufactured by heating a single block of steel and then forming it into shape with huge hydraulically operated rollers. That's why it's called a rolled section. Now some smaller highway bridges like this one use girders made of hot rolled sections, but most bridge girders like these are custom fabricated by welding individual steel plates together to form the flanges and web. These structural elements, called plate girders, are generally more efficient than hot rolled sections because they can be individually tailored to the requirements of a given structure. Plate girders can also be made much larger than even the largest hot rolled beams. Thus, plate girder bridges are routinely built with spans exceeding 300 feet while hot rolled beams are only suitable for spans about one third that length. But as we've seen before in this course, the quest to optimize a technology with respect to one performance criterion often creates problems with respect to other criteria. In the case of the plate girder, flexural strength and stiffness is enhanced by making the cross section taller and by using proportionately more material in the flanges but as this cross section gets taller and the web gets thinner, all sorts of new problems crop up. The first is a phenomenon that we first encountered in wooden floor joists in a platform framed residential floor system. The failure mode called lateral torsional buckling. Now recall that in general terms, buckling is an instability failure that occurs when a compressed structural element kicks out sideways like this. Now in bending, an I-shaped beam has its top flange in compression as well. So the top flange is susceptible to that same sort of buckling failure. When this happens, the top flange kicks out sideways like this, resulting in a twisting or torsional failure of the beam. Here it is again. And tall I-shaped girders are particularly susceptible to this failure mode because they're very flexible in torsion. Note how easy it is for me to twist this model I-girder. 
Now, the only practical way to prevent this failure mode in an I-shaped girder is to brace the top flange laterally so it can't buckle sideways. Again, just as we saw with a lateral torsional buckling in wooden floor joists. But what can we use to brace it? Why, another girder, of course. And herein lies the principal reason why I-girder bridges must have at least two girders. Each girder must be braced, at least in part, by its neighbor. In most modern highway bridges, this bracing function is accomplished in two ways. First, the girders are interconnected with these transverse frames called diaphragms, which function as miniature trusses to prevent the girders from twisting. Here's a set of actual diaphragms awaiting installation on a bridge. And by the way, these elements serve another important structural function that we'll discuss later. Second, the top flanges of the girders are usually rigidly connected to the concrete deck. Thus, just as wooden floor joists are strengthened against lateral torsional buckling by the subfloor panels, so steel bridge girders are strengthened by the concrete deck. The rigid connection between the girder and the deck is provided by these vertical steel posts called shear studs, which are welded to the girder's top flange. When the concrete is poured, it completely encases the studs and then hardens, creating a rigid mechanical connection. And not only does this connection prevent lateral torsional buckling, it also significantly increases the girder's flexural strength by turning the entire concrete deck into a sort of extension of the girder's top flanges. This is called composite construction, and it's particularly common on long-span girder bridges where the additional fabrication cost associated with welding all those shear studs onto the girder flanges produces its greatest payoff. These bridge girders don't yet have shear studs installed, but if we look very closely, we can see a clear indicator that they've been designed as composite girders. Can you see it? Notice that their top flanges are just a bit thinner and a bit narrower than their bottom flanges, indicating that the designer has planned for the additional contribution that the composite concrete deck will make to the strength of the top flange once the studs and concrete have been added. If the girder weren't intended to be composite, both flanges would be exactly the same size. Now, the other problems associated with tall, I-shaped girders are all related to the thinness of the web. And as you've probably guessed, the best way to understand the underlying structural phenomena is with a model. Now, the web of this model I-girder is made of thin sheet metal. And when I take that girder and place it on my supports, and then load it, you're going to see that the concentrated reaction force out at the supports causes the web itself to buckle vertically at its ends, like this. In actual girders, this issue is addressed by adding elements called web stiffeners. They're vertical steel plates welded to the web at all supports, as you can see here. And so, I've added web stiffeners to this model. And once again, I'll place it on my supports and load it. But now a new problem arises. Notice that as I apply load, the entire web of the girder seems to buckle diagonally between the web stiffener and midspan where I'm applying the load. The underlying cause of this issue is a phenomenon called shear or shearing. This phenomenon is quite complex, but at the most fundamental level, it's the tendency of the girder web to distort from a rectangular shape to a parallelogram shape on either side of the applied load, as shown in this diagram. Note that when I apply a shearing force to this book, we see exactly the same effect. The problem of shearing and girder webs can be addressed in either of two ways. The first, which is most common on older bridges, is to add web stiffeners all along the length of the girder, as you can see in this photo. And this approach works quite well, as you can see in my model. Here I've added web stiffeners along the length of the girder, and when I apply the same loading that I did before, you can see that there is still a tendency of the web to buckle, but now that buckling is contained by the additional vertical web stiffeners, and therefore the girder is significantly strengthened. 
The problem with web stiffeners is that they're expensive to fabricate and install, often offsetting the cost savings that might have been gained from using a thinner web. So today, the more common solution is simply to use a somewhat thicker web, sometimes augmented by just a few stiffeners placed on the inside of the girder web, where they won't adversely affect the aesthetics of the bridge. These internal stiffeners can also serve as mounting points for the diaphragms, as you can see in my computer model, and in this actual bridge. Now, by the way, in the foreground of this photo, you can also see additional diagonal bracing interconnecting the bottom flanges of two adjacent girders. This is called wind bracing, and as the name suggests, its purpose is to prevent the girder from bending sideways in response to lateral wind pressure exerted on the girder webs. After today's lecture, I hope you'll start looking more closely at everyday bridges. And when you do, you'll probably notice that many older bridges, like this one, use only two girders, which typically extend above the level of the roadway, like this. But virtually all newer bridges use more than two girders. Why is this? Well, there are several reasons, but the most important is that using a larger number of smaller girders provides improved safety through structural redundancy. If one girder of a two-girder bridge fails, the structure will almost certainly collapse. If one girder of an eight-girder bridge fails, the structure will almost certainly survive, saving lives and ultimately allowing for repair rather than replacement. But why would a girder fail anyway? Isn't it the bridge engineer's job to ensure that this doesn't happen? Well, certainly. Bridge engineers take every reasonable precaution to avoid failure. But the ugly truth is that a zero probability of failure is impossible to achieve. Sometimes natural disasters load structures in ways that no engineer could anticipate. Sometimes the drivers of trucks and buses don't pay attention to overhead clearance restrictions. But the most important reason for structural redundancy is fatigue the progressive accumulation of damage in metals subjected to repetitive loading. In a steel bridge girder, fatigue begins with a microscopic defect or crack in a web or flange, or more likely at a welded connection where concentrations of stress tend to occur. If this portion of the girder is repetitively loaded in tension, each cycle of load extends the crack by a minute amount. Over time, as this process continues, the extension of the crack gets progressively larger as the concentration of stress at the tip of the crack gets higher. At some point, typically after a few hundred thousand load cycles or more, the crack can reach a critical length, at which point a sudden catastrophic fracture of the entire girder occurs. Now, fatigue isn't a significant concern in steel-framed buildings because buildings typically don't experience enough load cycles for fatigue cracks to approach their critical length. But major bridges are routinely crossed by thousands of heavy trucks per day, perhaps a million per year, and each truck produces a substantial load cycle that can contribute to fatigue damage. Thus, fatigue is an overriding concern in steel bridge design. Bridge engineers address this concern in three ways. First, by avoiding the specific types of welded connection details that are most prone to fatigue-related problems. Second, through rigorous quality control in the fabrication and assembly of bridge components, to include such measures as x-raying welds to ensure that they have no internal defects. And third, by providing structural redundancy. This approach is often called belt and suspenders engineering. Take every reasonable precaution to prevent failure, and then provide a backup system just in case a failure happens anyway. Remember Kipling's poem, The Sons of Martha, from Lecture 1. They do not preach that their God will rouse them a little before the nuts work loose. Now, having looked very closely at steel girders in a multi-girder bridge, let's examine the concrete alternative to steel. As we've seen, the most fundamental characteristic of concrete as a structural material is that it's very strong in compression very weak in tension. And because beams experience comparable magnitudes of tension and compression, the only practical way to use concrete in flexure is to reinforce the portion of the beam that's in tension. In most structures, this reinforcement takes the form of steel reinforcing bars, like these 
which are positioned in the concrete forms before the concrete is poured. After the concrete is hardened, the steel and concrete are locked together into a single composite structural entity. Conventional reinforced concrete was used extensively for highway bridges in the early and mid 20th century, though today it's considered to be obsolete and has been largely replaced by a far superior technology. Let's see why. I'm going to use this stack of wooden blocks to represent a concrete beam. Now, this might seem like a stretch, but it's actually a reasonable representation because like concrete, the stack is very strong in compression. As long as I push inward, it holds together, but it has essentially no strength and tension. Watch what happens when I attempt to use it as a beam. Just falls apart. Because of this lack of tensile strength, which is so critical for uh, flexural behavior, I'm going to reinforce the bottom portion of this girder by inserting this steel reinforcing bar. And then I'll use a washer and a nut on each end just to hold it in place, simulating the effect of the concrete providing a rigid bond between the steel and the concrete beam that surrounds it. Now I'm going to set up a set of supports for our girder. And I will place the beam on the supports. Now you see it, it does carry its own weight reasonably well, but I'm also going to apply an additional superimposed loading in the form of these three bricks. And what you can see is that while the girder carries this load successfully, it cracks noticeably all along its bottom surface as a result of the tensile loading that naturally occurs in the bottom of any beam in flexure. Now, it's important to recognize that this is absolutely normal behavior for a reinforced concrete beam. For steel to provide the necessary tension reinforcement in the bottom of the beam, the steel has got to stretch. And the amount of stretch necessary to mobilize even a modest portion of the steel's own strength is far beyond the threshold at which concrete cracks. Thus, the presence of moderate cracking in the bottom of a reinforced concrete beam actually tells us that the steel reinforcement is doing its job. But normal as it might be, cracking causes two critical problems. First, it leads to significantly increased deflection or sagging of the beam. And I think you can see that deflection in my model. And second, these cracks can expose the steel reinforcement to moisture, which leads to corrosion and potentially to a catastrophic loss of tensile strength. In building structures where reinforced concrete is used quite often today, these issues generally aren't problematic because span lengths can be kept relatively short to control deflections and the building envelope can protect the beams from exposure to moisture. But in bridges, the need for longer spans and for constant exposure to the elements have effectively rendered reinforced concrete obsolete and stimulated the development of a new technology called pre-stressed concrete. The concept of pre-stressed concrete is actually well over a century old, but the technology didn't really catch on for bridges until the 1950s. Since then, its use has grown steadily even as improved materials and design methods have significantly improved its effectiveness and efficiency. For the everyday bridges that we're focusing on today, there are two principal methods of fabricating pre-stressed concrete girders. Both occur in a controlled factory environment, not out on the construction site. In the first method, a series of extremely high strength steel wires called tendons are strung between two anchorages mounted on the shop floor. Hydraulic jacks are then used to stretch the tendons almost to their breaking point. Next, the concrete beam is cast around the stretched tendons. After a few days, the concrete hardens enough to form a strong bond with the tendons. The reusable forms are removed, the ends of the tendons are cut free, and the tension in the tendons is transferred to the concrete as compression. The mechanism for this transfer of force is the bond between the steel tendons and the surrounding concrete. This technique is called pre-tensioning, 
because the tendons are stretched before the concrete is cast. In the second method, a hollow duct containing an unloaded tendon is cast right into the concrete girder. And then after the concrete has cured, the tendons are anchored at one end with wedges, tensioned with hydraulic jacks from the opposite end, and then anchored at that end as well. This process is called post-tensioning. Now, in either case, the effect on the concrete beam is essentially the same. And we can actually simulate this effect on my model by tightening this end of the steel rod that I've already embedded in the concrete. So I'm going to tighten this down first as much as I can by hand. And then I'm going to clamp off the back end. And use my wrench to finish the job. In this manner, I am effectively post-tensioning the beam. Now, note that in doing so, I've added tension to the rod, but the rod is itself compressing the bottom of the beam. And the beam actually arches upward slightly as a result. So now, with my girder on its structural supports, I can apply the same load that I applied previously to our reinforced concrete beam, and in this instance, you can see quite clearly that the effect of the pre-stressing has been to eliminate both the downward deflection of the beam and the cracking all along the bottom surface of the beam. And so you can see that in pre-stressed concrete, the effect of pre-stressing is to apply compressive stresses in the region of the beam that normally experiences tension. In a material like concrete that's strong in compression and very weak in tension, this offsetting of tension greatly improves structural performance. Here are several pre-stressed concrete beams awaiting installation on a bridge, and here they are in a completed multi-girder bridge structure. Note that these beams are I-shaped, meaning that they can achieve the same sort of structural efficiency we saw in steel girders. Yet because of their more robust proportions, these girders are not susceptible to the lateral torsional buckling problem or web buckling challenges that we saw in steel girders. For these reasons, today, pre-stressed concrete has become highly competitive with steel for short and medium span bridges. And so, when you're out on your next bridge sightseeing road trips, a pastime I highly recommend, you might very well see both types in comparable numbers. Now let's look beyond the girders at the structural system that's common to both steel and pre-stressed concrete multi-girder bridges, starting with the deck. A few decades ago, this bridge deck would have been constructed by first erecting temporary wooden formwork between the girders like this, and then adding these two layers of steel reinforcing bars, and then pouring concrete over the entire assembly. Two layers of reinforcement are needed because the critical loading for a bridge deck occurs when a heavy truck's wheel loads happen to be centered between the girders, like this. Note that under this loading, the bridge bends in double curvature, and here, where it's concave upward, tension occurs at the bottom, but here, where it's concave downward, tension occurs at the top. Therefore, two layers of reinforcement are needed. Well, that was then, but this is now. Today, this deck can be built at considerably lower cost and much faster by using this corrugated steel decking instead of temporary formwork. The decking holds the wet concrete just as formwork does, but it also provides permanent tension reinforcement at the bottom of the deck, and thus replaces the entire lower layer of reinforcing bars. When you drive beneath an overpass bridge and look up, you can usually see the product of this very ingenious system, as you can see in this photo. Now, when I introduced this structure at the start of today's lecture, I called it a simple multi-girder bridge. In this context, the term simple has a very specific meaning. It refers to the manner in which each girder is supported at its ends. In engineering textbooks, a simply supported beam is depicted symbolically, as you see in this diagram, with something called a pin support at one end and a roller support at the other. 
The pin prevents the end of the beam from moving in both the vertical and horizontal directions. The horizontal restraint is important here because vehicle braking forces can impart huge horizontal loads on a bridge. The roller support at the opposite end of the beam supports that beam only from below, while allowing unrestrained horizontal movement. This lack of horizontal restraint is also important because it allows for thermal expansion and contraction of the beam. Between the extreme temperatures of a cold winter night and a hot summer day, a 100-foot-long steel girder expands about one inch. And if the supports don't accommodate this movement, the resulting internal stresses could be large enough to cause serious structural damage. Now, back in the day, bridge engineers designed pin and roller supports that look astonishingly similar to their symbolic representations in textbooks. Here are a few examples. But today, smaller bridges typically use bearing pads like these, which are simpler and less expensive and actually perform better because they don't have any moving parts that can corrode and freeze up over time. Modern bridge bearing pads are typically made of synthetic rubber or polymer sandwiched between two steel plates. The flexible core accommodates the girder's lateral movement by shearing back and forth, just like my book. These bearings are supported on concrete abutments, which serve two complementary functions. First, they provide the bridge's structural foundation, transmitting its weight and all of its applied loads down into the soil below. Second, they serve as retaining walls, holding back the earth embankments on which the roadway is built. In multi-girder highway bridges, the principal alternative to simple supports is the continuously supported span. And here's how it works. In addition to pin and roller supports out at its ends, this configuration includes one or more intermediate supports, which are usually mounted on concrete piers, like this one in the center of my model. As the name suggests, a continuously supported girder extends continuously from one abutment across the intermediate pier to the other abutment without any breaks in continuity. This configuration is somewhat more structurally efficient than a simply supported span because that single girder bends in double curvature, much like the bridge deck we examined earlier. Note, concave upward bending out on the ends of the span, concave downward bending over the intermediate support. For this reason, and because a single intermediate pier can be positioned very conveniently in the median of a divided highway, two-span, continuously supported multi-girder bridges are used quite commonly for highway overpasses, like this one. The Everyday Highway Overpass Bridge is a thoughtfully engineered system that serves as an essential component of our transportation infrastructure. When we notice these structures at all, we tend to think of them as unremarkable or perhaps even ugly. Yet many have a simple elegance that clearly reflects a designer's effort to provide us with something beyond bare utility, perhaps even something worth admiring. Back at the start of this lecture, I read a few lines from the beginning of Will Allen Dromgoole's poem, The Bridge Builder. What better way to conclude than with the final few lines? There followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way, the chasm that has been as naught to me to that fair-haired youth might a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Large or small, elegant or humble, there really is something about a bridge.